meeting on the traditional territory of the Sanamo First Nation. And our first item on order is to, to call the meeting to order. And what I'd like to do just before we get started is do a roll call. So if you can have everybody, um, how do you want to do this? Um, you can just say here. And if everybody could say uh, here and their name, um, and then we'll just put you on our list. So we see Lisa. We could just start, Don. Okay. Um, I'll uh, I'll call out your name and, and you say here. How's that? Uh, Lisa McCarthy. Yeah, I'm here. And we have legislative services. Myself, uh, Lisa Dale, and legislative staff is here. Aaron. Uh, Jason. Here. Cameron Miller. Here. Uh, John? Here. Dave Stewart? Here. Karen? Here. Uh, Sydney? Here. Heidi Hartman? Here. And we have uh, phone number 250-619-8285. Who's that? Well, it's Benita that's calling in from my cell phone, but that's not my cell phone number. Uh, which one's your cell phone number? It's 667-4171. Okay. So there's that one. Okay. I need to see. 619-8285 is 60. Okay. And it's Lisa Murphy. I'm here, too. Okay, so there might be two, like this, what they've called in, as well as the okay. call and use of ones. Yeah. I do know that Kim Spice is also trying to join. I'm just reporting on the information. Okay, thanks. We haven't seen him yet. Yes? Uh, Sheila, our MLA, would like to listen in. Is she allowed to, or should I just tell her she texted me? It's live, being live streamed. Yeah, she's being live streamed. Let her know it's being live streamed with the link. Yeah, Signe, if you want to let her know it's being live streamed off the city website. Okay. So we got everybody's name. So um, I'm, item number two is introduction of late items. I'm guessing we don't have any. No, no late items. Um, and looking forward. To, has everyone seen a copy of the agenda? I'm hoping so. So I'm looking for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Move, Aaron. Yeah. I have Aaron and um, Kim. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that's passed. Uh, the next item, nine, number four, is adoption of the minutes. Uh, motion to adopt the minutes is presented. That's uh, Councillor Hemmons and... Help me help here, folks. Need a seconder. Second. Thank you. Second. Kim? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. That's passed. Excellent. Uh, on number five, reports. Uh, 5A, COVID response, homeless, vulnerable populations, motion for discussion. Introduced by Lisa. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, just confirming with a thumbs up that everybody can hear me. Okay, thanks. So what we have today is on April the 1st, last week, Council in a special meeting passed the following two motions. One was to endorse a plan to provide additional temporary washrooms and hand sanitization facilities in the downtown. And the second was to exempt the Health and Housing Task Force from the current suspension of committees um, to address our current situation with planning for vulnerable populations during the pandemic and to make any recommendations to council as necessary. So that is pretty much why we are gathered here today is as a result of that direction from council to use this task force for the purposes of planning collaboratively for vulnerable populations. So I'm going to quickly um, see if maybe Councillor Bonner would like to speak further to that motion and then go, go to an update date on the hand sanitization and washrooms. Um, we're looking at the 
temporary auctions right now or the second one? The second one, since it's the overall purpose of our committee. Yeah, it was, it was my understanding, and I, I'm going to look to the, uh, to, to the agencies in the room here as well, in the meeting, uh, that uh, in order to facilitate as, as much as we can, both from the federal and pro province, uh, that we would need a, a coordinated uh, ask uh, that includes um, BC Housing, uh, Island Health, City, uh, as well as uh, the agencies that are working in our town. So that's the, the, the gist behind the motion. Um, I would look to, um, right now it is, is the idea is, how do we go about uh, getting that done? So if anybody would like to speak on that. Anybody? resources to address the situation with COVID-19, but it's really about partnerships. So really appreciating that the council acknowledges that and the community has already done some really amazing work at bringing forward some solutions. I think it was helpful to all of us um, when we had a call with the MPC earlier today just to clarify what that process is and to determine roles and responsibilities and to acknowledge the work that it is already being done. Thanks for that. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that, but it's really about you know, Island Health and BC Housing, and Lisa, please jump in um, at any point. You were on the call as well. But I yeah. think having a plan, a, a coordinated plan in response to priority populations within the particular communities and preferred operational models as well. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, I think um, we have, it feels to me like we have real clarity now. We talked a little bit about the role of public health. Um, I represent mental health, but excuse me, we can represent island health in some ways, but we may need um, at times to have that clarity, but really looking at um, uh, how do we best um, help people shelter who are uh, not able to self-isolate, keeping that population so fairly clear and distinct from those who are presumptive positive or COVID positive. Um, and then we, we can also be clear about our different goals. I personally find that really helpful and I think we have that clarity now. Jason, can I ask you to uh, weigh in on this as well uh, from, your, from your perspective? Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that that meeting had this happen this morning. I mean, we, we've just been encouraging people to look at the Emergency Management BC uh, framework. Um, I guess what we put forward from the coalition, we've been meeting for numerous weeks, and I can say that there's dozens of agencies that just feel in the dark uh, about what the community response is going to be. And we're, most of us are, are operating essential services that are expected to keep people out of the main health system. So all we were, what we put forward uh, was more suggestions for discussion. Obviously, if other things are being handled, that's great, but I think we'd like to know that so that we can focus on operations. So bringing back the, the task force so that we can have some uh, open and transparent conversations as best as we can uh, so that we can allocate the resources that we do have uh, to the right parts of the response. And I think that would go, uh, Signe would probably be able to talk more about this because we do have, through the coalition, we have reaching home dollars that we want to be smart about where we put them into action in the community, but without knowing what everyone else is doing, because we do know conversations are happening, but it's not being shared with us. Uh, it would be helpful for us to then be able to uh, quickly allocate those dollars uh, to a meaningful response. So glad that we're back together today. Sydney, did you want to add to that? I guess my uh, topic had a great meeting today. Is there any 
If I could repeat for Signe, I think she was asking for some clarification, Heidi and Lisa, who are also on the call with the city, about the clarification of the roles and responsibilities. And I, I will say that later on in the agenda, we do have that roundtable piece on organizational roles and responsibilities, but we do appear to be discussing it now. Um, the Heidi and Lisa, um, perhaps you can speak to what EMBC were sharing, and that was very much about health and housing leading this and leading, um, identifying the objectives of the planning process and also working together, health and housing, to come up with a plan and then work with uh, local government and the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre to um, make any requests to resource the plan. Can you, I'll, I'll let Heidi or and Lisa jump in at this point. Absolutely. So this is Heidi, and, and um, just to confirm what what Lisa said, it is what we heard uh, is that Island Health and BC Housing should be leading that work on um, developing a plan and bringing it forward to the community. Um, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge the whole process has been very confusing. It, if I might just say that I know various communities on the island have responded differently. I know that Victoria ramped up right away and um, established a working group and started identifying a plan. And even as I worked through that, even I had a call with the NBC last night and the city of Victoria, we're still reworking it. Um, to be able to ensure that the process is followed. So um, that from my end was, was very clarifying, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge that the communities around the province have responded differently, and certainly the correspondence that came out from the province over the weekend to the municipalities just confirmed the province not um, advising that they weren't moving forward. Um, with the model where municipality or that they requisitioned municipal sites, that that wasn't the model that that um, the province was requesting. That it's about a collaborative. Um, and sorry, I've got a little puppy here, and he's making lots of noise. Sorry, um, but you know, definitely the the model is about collaboration, community working together. Um, the, I know the city already um, completed the survey um, to EMBC, so certainly all those proactive steps have really helped. Sure. Take one second. Okay. So, Jake, you were trying to speak? No, I just want to say one second. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure, go ahead. So, um, we're getting what I hear is talk about plan. It, are we all talking about the same plan, or are we talking about the creation of a plan? I'm, I'm hearing it used by multiple people, and I'm not sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So, if I could just have clarity, the, the EMDC, EV housing, those island shelters, and clarity around that kind of medical response that's coming. Um, and that, that's great. Um, I'm curious if we have any clarity, <clears throat> excuse me, around the community response. That would be more in the providers and, and um, yeah. So Heidi and Lisa, as the main contractors and funders of many of the social yeah, services, uh, maybe you could speak I to that? Say, um, I would say the urgent creation of a plan um, in that we just met with ENBC today at 12. I think the, the planning is very much in the work now. And to what I've heard um, um, 
for many, including the call yesterday morning with uh, shelter providers, is uh, the need to have it clearly stated. Um, I'm a shelter worker. It's Friday evening, and I think this person is showing symptoms of COVID. What do I do? Who do I call? Who assesses them? Um, and then where do they go? Um, uh, and then once those symptoms have resolved after 10 to 14 days, are they coming back? Um, are they going elsewhere? It's almost those step-by-step -step, um, responses for individual um, people. Um, I think what, um, I don't know, about an hour later, I think um, we're talking about, in my mind, we're talking about supporting people who are in um, sheltering opportunities yet to be named, and then we're talking about isolation and monitoring by health of people who are probably in hotel rooms because they're COVID presumptive positive or COVID positive, um, and that's only a 10 to 14 day um, stay, and then they may return to a shelter um, or other options, um, uh, sometimes not great options. Um, but that, um, that's what that transition of care would look like. The monitoring would include ensuring that they don't in fact need to go to hospital, that they're not people who are becoming more ill. So the people who are in the shelters or um, not in the sheltering or isolation and monitoring opportunities um, would be because they are not people who have COVID. Hopefully that makes sense. It's not documented yet. We're, um, we have to report our, our plans up, um, through each community. So um, we don't have approval for that, but that is the principle. And I, from what I understand, that's what people are looking for, that real clarity step by step. Okay, and Lisa, if I may, how are you, and I don't put it just on you, but that group that met today, what are the channels of communication with, between the outcomes of that meeting and the people doing the frontline work? Is there any, is there a communication channel going back and forth? Or I, I'm just, I'm, I'm recognizing Jason's comment about having a number of our frontline organizations feeling like they're in the dark. And I would like the city to play a role in disseminating and yeah. that, sharing of information as best as we can. Sorry, it's super, I think that's Erin, it's super athlete, but I think I got the question. I I would see that, I mean, I'm just guessing totally, but I would see that perhaps as a role of our group here together. How do we best communicate um, across so that we have that broad um, um, and get it to the right people quickly enough, recognizing and messaging that if it continues to follow the um, trajectory it has that we may need to stay nimble knowing that it may change again. So I don't know what you think, Heidi, it feels. Um, EMBC invited us to the call today and it feels like we got more clarity than I thought. I'm happy to weigh in, Lisa, and um, what I would say um, to two questions, that it's great that the Health and Housing Task Force it is continuing because this is the venue to get that communications going. Um, I, I, I do also want to honor um, Jason's question about the plan. Um, so EMBC clarified that Island Health and BC Housing would, um, you know, develop a plan. And the way I see the community response with their plan is feeding into um, to that that overall community plan because the, the community and the service providers have brought forward some amazing opportunities that, that, that will fuel the overall community plan, if you will. Thank you, Heidi, for that clarification. I just um, heard from Sheila Malcolmson and her staff that someone is typing, and so the live stream is coming through with only typing sounds, not voices. Okay, that's. Sure we should all mute our microphones if we're not speaking. 
That, that might help. We do have to type in our room because Ledge Services is taking notes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we can try to mute while others are talking and see if that works. Okay. We're going to try and mute while others are talking. Okay. And if I, because I, I kind of, um, I was distracted there. What I hear you saying, Heidi and Lisa, is that there's going to be a medical response. If you see housing, island, all everything everything clear, information from EMCB on that. We still don't know what that's going to look like, but it's coming. And that is going to be nestled in our own community response that looks at how we deal with this whole thing. Uh, yeah, I think so. I would just add, um, and Jason, maybe this is, um, I think this is probably already known at the coalition. Um, uh, Amanda Lemon is our manager for community services in MHSU with Island Health, and Stephanie McHugh, who some of you know, is helping um, Amanda brand new in her role. Stephanie McHugh is supporting this work, so there. Um, the local contact everything I know, I can connect um, that they know. Um, so feel free, if there's questions, feel free to reach out um, to me or either of them. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want it to be experienced as a lack of transparency. I think it's just really that um, it's all moving quickly and it's hard to, um, I can see that there might be gaps and I would, wouldn't want people to not reach out. Lisa, I'll just quickly speak to it. Uh, you guys have been great at communicating to us about uh, the isolation end of this, and I do know that you're working on what the protocols are, and I know the shelter yeah. providers are aware of that and everyone else. Has. And uh, the, the space for input on that plan has been, it's been great on the isolation end of things, uh, and I think a lot of the questions that the rest of us in the community have about are about what other uh, things are we going to be able to action that we're seeing action in other areas of the province that they've already got moving and got going when it comes to sheltering opportunities and food security and, and some of those other needs. Um, I think that we, obviously all of us under this time, we wish it was happening faster, um, but I think that's common to everyone. Um, but yeah, I think we're looking at some of where the other opportunities are for members of organizations in the community to step up and do their part. Yeah, and I think I'll stop talking after this. I do, um, for my, and it could be just how I think, I find as we're getting clearer and clearer about our language, isolation, you know, COVID positive, presumed positive, I think it really helps us because then we, we at least know we're offering it the right thing um, and helps us understand the PPE require is it it's just it's almost like identifying the client need almost diagnosing the need and then we can flow out of there and I, I think that's been um, it's been hard even to have the same language have a shared description of what we're talking about I think we're getting there Uh, does anybody else want to have a question on that? Um, Let's jump here. Uh, I, I'm just wondering if we have some sense of a timeline associated with some of this planning. Uh, so we might sort of, do we know a date? So um, I can say at least that if I don't know if I need to fill the same way, if we do, if we do, if the uh, client um, was to be COVID positive in the emergency department today and homeless, our team could rally and find a place for them and monitor them. So although we're waiting for a plan that we could, uh, you know, all share a written document, the work could start. And I'll just ask a follow-up, who is doing the actual written document? Um, with Island Help, we're doing an Island Help one. It's going up to our executive state. Thanks so much. And then when we have executive support, then, and Heidi, it's no surprise, Heidi knows everything that's in there. But then Heidi, I assume, Heidi, you have something that we create kind of a shared, um, probably simplified document that we can 
um, there's some resource apps within it, so we have to um, take it through our Absolutely, and this is Heidi, and, and just to confirm, that plan from Island Health really solidifies, you know, um, BC Housing's response with assets. Um, I just share um, that we are um, finalizing the hotel rooms that we've secured here in Nanaimo uh, because the, it hasn't been finalized. I don't want to jeopardize that very precious resource, but potentially 40 to 50 units for, for Nanaimo, and we would work through a very similar process to coordinated access and assessment where we work with community partners based on Island Health um, priority groups for those, those hotel units. And what I can share is we've got tremendous lessons learned by opening up the units that we, um, that we started filling in Victoria over the last 10 days. Hi, you could ask a the question. thing I'd just like to add is, so it's been BC Housing's commitment from the beginning, even without a plan, that if there are additional shelter opportunities, that we, were, we want to fund those and support those in the community. Um, so I know that wasn't an option um, for St. Peter, but just want to emphasize that you know, separate from the plan, that that commitment to community hasn't changed. That if there is a site and there is staffing to be able to support and operate it, we we can fulfill that funding in a in a very quick way. So, uh, Heidi, if I could ask a, just a simple question, uh, I hope um, when uh, when we see it in the press release uh, refers to Victoria. Is that Victoria proper, or is that the, the greater municipalities of Victoria? I'm just trying to get a number idea. And, um, in this case, it's only uh, greater Victoria, um, based on the individuals and their needs. Um, being central to Victoria was key. Um, we did look at other um, outside of Victoria as well, um, all the way out to Sydney. And those are on the back burner. We haven't finalized them, but they are an opportunity. And I think that's the important thing to know that um, the plan changes based on every day what we're seeing. So, you know, potentially, do we have to go to Royal Oak? Do we have to go to Sydney? It's going to be based on who comes forward as a priority. You know, we also have to acknowledge that. Um, vulnerable is very, it's all encompassing. We're also working um, with the Women's trans Transition House Program and we've secured units up and down the island uh, because we're, you know, police are reporting um, higher instances of domestic violence in communities. So we've had to be responsive to that and we've got numerous hotel rooms up and down the island in many communities to address that need. Okay, thank you. Say it again. I don't think she heard you. Okay. So uh, this is Cam here. I, I can confirm what Heidi said about the increase in number of domestics. We're seeing it across all uh, socioeconomical levels and uh, the spike is actually quite, uh, quite disturbing. Interesting enough that while well, domestics are up, shoplifting is down, mostly because most stores are closed at this time and uh, those who were doing shoplifting obviously can't get access to closed stores. If there's, a, does anybody else have any questions or, or comments on the uh, item A? If not, I would like to move forward to number B. And I'll, I'll read out the motion again, uh, just for, for everybody's, uh, in, everybody's information. It was moved to second that council direct the Health and Housing Task Force develop a food security plan including funding, procurement, and distribution options to provide safe, consistent meals for individuals experiencing homelessness and the vulnerable population. And I'll just speak to a little bit about this and ask others to, to come in as well. Um, my understanding is that um, as the agencies are, are starting to um, uh, cut down some of the services, food uh, distribution and food uh, feeding the homeless is becoming a bit more of a, a critical issue. 
uh, some of the agencies aren't able to do the amount of work they were doing before. In addition to that, um, there is, uh, as we see, there's a number of uh, farmers who now are having trouble getting their uh, food to market. And there's a number of restaurants that are out of, uh, uh, not working right now because they have nobody coming in. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, a perfect storm. Uh, we have all of these uh, elements uh, that need help. And I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to see if there's a possibility of developing a plan that we could go forward with to bring all of these organizations together, at, at which point uh, we can provide uh, food not only to the homeless, but to the vulnerable population in our city. With that said, I'm not expecting that BC Housing would be spearheading this, this uh, discussion, or on in health for that matter, although I would certainly um, look to them to see if there was a possibility that they could uh, help or, or have input in, into this plan. Um, I, that's my part of it. Um, I'd like to know if anybody else would like to speak to it. If not, I can carry on. Okay, uh, through the chair, sure. I can give an update on this, and this will actually blend a little bit into C, which is uh, some of the actions that sit the city have been taking. So um, going back maybe a couple weeks ago, we started connecting with some of the larger emergency food providers like the food bank and starting to track um, how people were doing with their different service provisions. So um, individually contacting people, seeing where they were at, whether they had any additional needs. And then yesterday, um, along with the United Way, we pulled together that group. So that included the Salvation Army, the 710, uh, Loaves and Fishes, Food Bank, um, School District 68, um, the Nanaimo Youth Services Association, and also Food Share, who've been quite instrumental in looking at the bigger picture of food security, to talk about now yesterday's meeting predominantly focused on emergency food provision, looking at the capacity of the existing providers to continue to meet demand, and where they saw themselves falling short of demand, what were the opportunities for collaboration or for providing information through to us. So. Our next steps then are to summarize this information and the notes from that meeting will be distributed along with a Excel spreadsheet showing where each, the status of each organization is. And one of the things that um, I think Signe and the coalition, some of the coalition leads have pointed out is that we have an opportunity to work through the EMBC process, see where um, gaps can be filled to support existing emergency food and where there's a need to enhance, see if we can get those costs covered through EMBC and if they can't, there's an opportunity for uh, money that's been received through our community to be distributed to support those organizations. Um, and Signe, I know that you're probably going to speak to the 400,000 that has been added to the Reaching Home. Um, and, and how this group plays a role in helping direct some of those, those funds. Um, I guess overall I'd like to say that it, some of the food providers are actually doing quite well and adapting quite well. Uh, the food bank continues to get um, a high number of uh, uh, food recovery, they continue to do that, and they're adjusting their uh, model of distribution and their volunteers to meet the social and physical distancing. Um, they have, they know that they're able to come to us for support. I think we've just provided a very minimal request to provide traffic cones to them at this point, and we're on standby to see if them, them and others have requests that we can filter on through a coordinated effort. Um, the nice thing about bringing the group together, and Signe, you can speak to this, is uh, there was the opportunity for Peter Sinclair to offer to help with bulk 
buying of food to support some of the other providers. Um, and one of the things is while we have some organizations like the food banks saying they have a surplus of volunteers, we then have the 710 saying that they are in need of volunteers. Um, and that, that speaks to the staffing challenges I think a lot of nonprofits are having right now. So um, I thought it was a really good start um, in terms of an overall strategy. Um, and I think that even as we develop both the short-term immediate response to support the different organizations, there's that longer-term piece as we look at the long-term economic impacts that this crisis is having on our community that uh, particularly the most vulnerable that we know are in the lower income brackets and planning for that at the same time. And I think this is where um, Food Share and uh, also the United Way uh, have identified that in terms of the need for broader strategy. So, Signe, I'm going to hand over to you because I feel like I've just spoken quite a bit. So, um, would you like to jump in? Yes, and actually I'm just, oh. Yeah, I think if Signe at least, I just want to jump in and say, I think um, that itself, so much of it depends on the numbers we see, right? That's where, my, uh, that's where I get a little bit muddled. I think my guess is next week um, or at the end of this week, we will know a little bit more about what kind of numbers we might see and if it's COVID positive people that were, um, because if we were to have a certain number of COVID positive people, then we know that exponential growth starts to happen. 
Um, otherwise, I think we'll be diverting some of our energy to um, the mental health needs that arise out of this, um, you know, the stress that people are under across the board. So it's just so um, it's so hard to know what the, what we'll be looking at in terms of the response for the week from now. I don't know if other people agree, but I think um, that's uh, that's where we're just all going to have to stay really connected, I guess. Because it could be food next week. It could be more about still um, trying to help people find a place to isolate. Those kinds of things. Okay, and I, if I might jump in, it's Heidi. I. Oops, somebody muted Heidi. Okay, Heidi, you've just been muted. I don't think I did. did I just okay. Well, it's not, they have muted Heidi. Actually, Heidi, while we're waiting for you, maybe if I could see if in five minutes or less I can give an update of the status so people can understand where the different organizations are at. So in terms of free meal programs, um, there was a rumor that the 710 weren't running. They've continued to operate. They're doing a bag breakfast. So in order to allow for physical distancing. They provide that with a hot drink, mornings 7 to 10, Monday to Friday, and most Saturdays. And so far, they're managing to keep up with the demand um, that they're seeing. The Salvation Army also does a bag lunch. Again, because of social distancing, they're no longer, they're doing that through a mobile food truck. Um, and they're providing that seven days a week. They also are now making sure that all their meals are free. There was a nominal $2 charge that oftentimes they'd hand out tickets. Um, but to make sure there's no perceived or actual barrier, there's no um, cost associated with any of the meals they provide. Uh, we also have seen Wisteria Community Association, also known as Stone Soup, start to provide a mobile service between 6 and 8 p.m., seven days a week. Um, uh, so some of that, that's also started up um, in addition to the existing meal services that are meeting the capacity for the demand they're getting. Um, where well, some of the challenges that those, uh, particularly the Salvation Army and 7TEM, have mentioned is that they may need support with um, ensuring physical distancing after they distribute the meals and ensuring that people do maintain space between each other while they're eating their meals. Uh, staffing is a challenge. Um, and that they do foresee perhaps needing more supplies as well as staff should demand increase. Some other options, I mentioned the loaves and fishes who have adapted quite well and are continuing to adapt quite well to the changing um, circumstance and are keeping up and are indicating they actually do have um, capacity to provide more food um, for use by nonprofits. Um, Nanaimo Youth Service Association has started a free weekly food hamper for youth aged 15 to 30 and uh, they can be contacted and those weekly food hampers can be booked for a month at a time and that's for youth 15 to 30 and their families. Uh, the Food Share Good Food Box continues to go monthly um, through Nanaimo Food Share. They say they have capacity to expand that with resources and they also have the capacity if needed to make use of a commercial kitchen for um, meal preparation. Um, the Nanaimo Family Life Service is looking at free, doing free meal delivery for seniors through their Better at Home program, which is accessed through BC211. And part of that is funding that's come through the COVID response. And then the Nanaimo Lady Smith Foundation is doing weekly food hampers. And I believe that actually started this week um, for school-aged children in their school district. And uh, that's across all schools, originally looking at um, their around between, I think close to 700 students, but they are looking at expanding that for up to about 1,000 students and their families. And they're working quite closely with uh, the food bank to use the food bank's resources as part of that. So those are the immediate things in the works that continue. And then the other pieces that uh, Council of Honor was speaking about in terms of looking at future plans connecting uh, those who are food producers and enhancing some of their work. Uh, those are conversations that um, we've started initially and we look forward to continuing with uh, Food Share and the United Way. 
um, because I think as we look to the future, we do see that there is an opportunity to use our existing skill set and resources in community as we anticipate this crisis will disrupt um, and increase poverty for many families. So I, I think I actually kept that five minutes, so. Um, I'm gonna ask you to mute us. Jason, did you have something you wanted to add? If I, if I don't mind, I think what this is, I mean, all of those services are the things that predominantly already exist in the community. Oh, Lisa, the time. you can't and use the I mic. Yes, we've all shifted and changed what's going on. I think it, what it's doing for me anyway is highlighting the importance just of getting um, this broader plan at least framed out and to, we have to scope what we're meaning by the, the response to food security. Like if we, if we do create another emergency shelter, which has been proposed uh, several times, um, is this food response feeding the people there? Uh, is it going to be feeding people that we put in hotels, obviously feeding people that are on the, the isolation or the people that fall ill end of things? And I think we have to scope what we're looking at. And it, there are obviously the broader social things that will come out of this. But I think it'll help us look at the, the numbers for the moment when we decide what our actual response for this community is going to be. Uh, and it helps us frame out what we're even talking about. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's pretty nebulous if we're just talking about it broadly like that. And uh, I think the thing that has always been, it's been striking me for weeks that we should be shifting away from asking providers like ours and others to figure out how we're making food with the meager staff resources that we have. We need to focus on allowing them to support the people that we have. And we may have to start looking at, especially if it's a broader and wider response. We have lots of restaurants that are out of work that have supply chains, They've already got Island Health vetting um, for, for their places, and we could start funding those individuals to be producing the food for the places that we need it in the interim, um, which allows everybody else to maintain their staff at work. So I just, I really encourage people that we need to get on this plan quickly uh, to scope it, and then we can scope the food plan to match the broader plan that we're looking at. Exactly who we're prioritizing feeding versus uh, encouraging to get to other resources. Um, that's how you okay. um, thank you, Chair. So just so everybody is aware, I think the mute um, possibly might be muting us for those on Zoom. However, we're not muted for the live streaming and video that we're doing. So just to keep that in mind. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> So, uh, Lisa? To the chair, Jason, thank you very much. Um, I, oh, can everybody hear me? I'm going to speak without the mic. Okay, I'm going to try and do my best Superintendent Miller voice here. So, um, I think there's an opportunity through the Health and Housing Task Force, I think, uh, to have more nimble, perhaps, working groups to carry on the work that we started yesterday and perhaps others have specifically on this topic. One of the things we were trying to do as staff is to try and take a look at, get a sense from the different food providers, what is the demand, what's their capacity to meet this demand, and what additional resources are needed. And so Jason, I think you're spot on with that, um, and that's something maybe the task force can discuss how you'd like to move forward. Um, this group is um, a structured group, and meets every two weeks as an opportunity to do something in between if the task force would like to, given the need for speed. Um, and then the other thing is I'd like to cue in Heidi to talk about, Jason, that very uh, topic around food provision and how it links between the shelter provision. So Heidi, if you're able to unmute and jump in, that would be great. Great, thanks for the opportunity and I would just really reinforce what I've seen in other communities and I think this collaboration has already happened that 
you know, that with the Reaching Homes funding, we, we use that to be very strategic of what each of our mandates are. So BC Housing is pretty specific about shelter and, and housing. So how can we, you know, be strategic in the, the Reaching Homes funding to be able to, to utilize that? The, the one difference that we do have during the COVID response right now is on our website, um, there is an opportunity if any of our housing providers are having challenges with um, providing meals during this challenging time, um, they just have to let their NPPM or Shaw know. Um, and they can do that through me. So if there are any of the providers in Nanaimo that are struggling with that, we'll do our best to support. So how can, you know, uh, let's be strategic with the Reaching the Homes Fund and use that for sites that the folks requiring isolation, if they're gonna need the food, that opportunity, we, we don't wanna duplicate. And BC Housing wants to use our funding toward our mandate. Um, some other funders may have more flexibility um, in their funding, so then they use their funding to fill in the gaps of where they are in community. So, um, thank you for that. Um, so, if uh, following up on Lisa's uh, suggestion here is that um, Going forward, uh, perhaps a number of us can have a subgroup uh, or get together and possibly flesh out what some of this food security is going to look like. Is is that? Uh, am I allowed to do that? Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> so, um, just from a um, legislative point of view, um, how would you be making decisions on how you would be moving forward? So that's, that's where it gets um, into problems. Um, who's making the decisions um, and or the recommendations to council for decisions? So one thing I could possibly suggest is during this crisis, you could meet more frequently as a whole, this way on a weekly basis, um, as long as it was in a conversation and not report type format as previously, so additional meetings and or you could have a subcommittee working group that's not a quorum, but then you would have to then bring those workings to this group to then make recommendations to council. So it's like an added level of... I, I, would, I would see it as the second one where a number of people on the committee could be meeting uh, and we, they could get input from other agencies that aren't on the committee. They would come up with a recommendation to bring to us, and we would hash it out at a, a meeting uh, where where all the other players are here, and then that recommendation would go to council. I think that would be the quickest and easiest way. So as long as you're not um, having a quorum of this task force, furthering the business of this task force um, without it being a proper task force meeting, because um, all of members aren't included and um, the public, it's not transparent. So that would work as long as it's not a quorum and you're not furthering the business of this committee um, without bringing it to this committee for them all to have the same. And, and is my understanding that we can't make a subcommittee? Um, no, you do not have the power to make a subcommittee. Council could make a subcommittee of this task force. Okay. So you could have a working group and bring it back to this table though. Like, like we just talked about. Yeah. I think we'll we'll go that route. Erin, did you wanna have did you wanna add something? So your hand go up. I'm not having a hard time and now I'm trying to go. And we're having a hard We're having a hard time hearing you uh, in English. It's, it's echoing. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah there you go. Yes. Perfect. Okay, sorry, I think I had two mics on me. Um, my question was going back a bit, but I think you may have covered it. I didn't quite hear Sheila's response and what our plan is going forward, but my question was, how do we move from the group that met yesterday, which was a sharing of information of current resources, into the motion that was approved by council on Wednesday, which is that the task force create a food security plan. So 
I'm hearing that we're going to form a working group of a subgroup um, of non-quorum members to work on this with the, the members that were also in yesterday's meeting. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. And a follow-up to that is, how, what is our quorum? What's the number of members who can participate? Um, so six is a quorum of this task force, so you couldn't have um, more than five. Okay. Do so I'm curious, do we want to identify who those five are going to be now? That, yes, Lisa would like that. <laughs> Great. Okay, I, I would, uh, if anybody wants to put their hand up and volunteer. Uh, I got Aaron, uh, Sydney, Jason, John, and. Drafting up or nominating up? <laughs> what was that? Are you asking us or nominating us? I just nominated you. Um, Lisa, would we want staff there or are you guys? Oh, yeah. Say? So, yeah, I, I would recommend John, that as, as one of the co-chairs of the coalition, uh, you can put me on whatever uh, committees that are relevant in this. And if there are others that fill in on one of the other committees, I will I will gladly stand back from that one, and, uh, as long as it's covered by John or Signe or someone else. Uh, and I just want to clarify with Sheila, say if we wanted perhaps Lisa or Heidi to step to talk, uh, but they're not officially part of the working group, we would just have to make sure that somebody stepped back from the conversation. Because there's a couple people who bring um, a connection between the shelter and housing piece that I think uh, and, would be and could that not be done at this table? Yeah. 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 Sorry, go ahead. Lisa Murphy, we could make sure if it's helpful to have someone on, on our end in that group. It wouldn't necessarily, it probably wouldn't be me, but we could make yeah. sure we have a local person there. Yeah, thank you. Dale just concurred that it could be a staff person who's not currently part of the Health and Housing Task Force. And so that would allow us to have like food share participate and any number of others. Right, and then, okay. and then whatever that working group worked on would then just be brought back to this task force yeah. and discussed amongst all of them. And we could meet as rapidly as we wanted without having to go through Yes, just the usual. practicing your distancing. And yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. So stand by for some Zoom calls with us. And um, I just want to also thank uh, Karen Constell who rapidly was uh, working to pull a lot together here and um, will be helping us work together on this, so, as well as all of you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So we can move on then? Okay. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at number uh, 5C, which is COVID response update for vulnerable population. Lisa is going to start that off. Okay, so what I was hoping to do is get, can everybody hear me? Okay. Feels like I'm shouting. Apparently, I have a low voice. So, uh, uh, if you don't hear me, if one of you could just raise your hands, that would be a good cue for me. Um, so, <laughs> so at, on April first, uh, Dale Lindsay gave a bit of an update to council on a few things that staff were going do, were doing with in relation to vulnerable populations. So, I'll cover some of that ground again. I'm going to start off with the washrooms because that was one specific motion that uh, Council endorsed. And uh, since Council endorsed that, um, starting, I'm going to look at Dale today or tomorrow. Hopefully by end of day today or definitely by tomorrow, there'll be three additional portable washrooms in the downtown. One located on Wesley Street near the overdose prevention site. One located across from the New Hope Center um, Salvation Army Shelter in, in the Victoria Crescent area. And then a third one uh, near the Community Services Building where the 710 operates. And these washrooms will also have hand sanitization facilities with them. So two of them will be near um, where people will be accessing food. Uh, the other thing I'd like to clarify is that the washrooms that the city has open in its parks currently remain open. 
and we have extended the hours of the one in the Diana Kroll Plaza, so it is open 24-7. And outside of that washroom, there is a water uh, facility where people can fill up bottles. So just to let people know that the, the washrooms at Maffeo Sutton and also Diana Kroll have continued to be open throughout this time. And um, so the other thing is the Salvation Army has let us know that they will be installing by tomorrow a hand sanitization facility near their mobile food truck. And they've also offered us the opportunity to locate a portable toilet if the location on Victoria Crescent doesn't work, they're, they're willing to have that on their parking lot near their mobile food truck. So those are some immediate pieces to follow through on councils. Uh, and I'm going to let Dale Lindsay speak. I just wanted to speak, Lisa's covered off the washrooms, but I think part of that, maybe it's not obvious in the title, but part of what was included in that plan was access to water. And that was one of the things we were hearing was a concern to access to fresh water. So there is, and we're trying to balance that between many of the fountains that we have and spread out through the downtown that we normally be turning on this time of year are the kind that are that have the, um, you know, the, the typical bowl with the with the small little arc of water that we all used in elementary school. So we're trying to not turn those on in this in this context with the pandemic. But there is some new, um, there's a, there's one specific newer model that we've installed down near the cenotaph which actually has an overhead fill, so it's set up to fill bottles from. So that one will be turned on. Lisa mentioned there's access to water at Diana Crawl, and there's also going to be access to water uh, near um, uh, near the waterfront, uh, right near the bastion. Uh, and also during during regular hours, there's out there's access to water in all of our park uh, park facilities. So that would be. From uh, early six morning to about eleven at yeah, night. so six in the morning to eleven at night. So we're we're addressing the water issue at that time uh, through those those options. And please note that we will be updating the city's website, so it's clear that all of these are available, and we'll link that through to the Nanaimo Homeless Coalition's website, where they've been providing uh, a very good set of resources. Let's see, John. John, you had something to say. Uh, is there anything uh, up around Devon area at all? We, we have uh, third party clients or uh, clients who are social services, uh, or sorry, ministers of uh, social development clients who, uh, who congregate up in that area on a regular basis. Um, and they often have mushroom access issues. Uh, and have we've had issues actually around our building associated with that because there is no way to access any facilities. Um. I'll, I'll jump in here, John. What, what we did say to council on Monday night was that this was the first uh, response, and that, and I, and I think members of, I think maybe even Councilor Bonner raised it at council that night that this is not just a downtown issue. So we recognize that uh, if there's a need, if there's if there's areas um, that this group identifies and thinks there need to be um, further attention paid to, we could always go back. And I think just to confirm that because we're under this emergency model framework right now, we have the opportunity to do cost recovery on these or, or attempt to do cost recovery. And EMVC has agreed to pay for the three portable washrooms that we're uh, distributing uh, through the downtown core at this point. So if there's further need, we can absolutely go back, reassess, and, and uh, make further requests. Then I'd also like to speak to the city's shower program run by the Unitarian Church in Caledonia. That continues to operate and uh, we have approved them extending the hours from, you know, from 7 to 10 to 7 to 11 to allow for better social distancing of um, the shower program users and also more time for any added demand. And they have seen an increase of demand, but they're managing that with the, with the extra hour. So that's another piece. We do know that Salvation Army were forced to withdraw their shower service, as well as their washroom access as a result of um, challenges with ensuring safety of clients and other users. Um, and we also know that the Harris House at the end of Wesley Street, which was a planned closure, um, that was a reduction because they also used to provide, through Island Health, um, a shower and a washroom. So that's no longer available, but our addition of the portable 
toilet at the end of Wesley will help address in part some of that uh, loss of a facility there. So um, again, we'll continue to monitor the shower program and see if there's, again, an opportunity to extend it beyond the additional hour. And that one runs five days a week. Um, other things that we've been involved in uh, also include that staff have been, this was started before Christmas, with um, before the winter season, knowing that we might need additional shelter even pre-COVID, we had been reaching out to the different faith groups in the community to see who might be interested in either both providing space and also other nonprofits who might be interested in operating shelters so that we can provide that information to BC Housing. And that sinks in with what Heidi had said, that if we know of any interested parties willing to provide uh, suitable shelter space and others willing to operate, the BC Housing are interested. So we have gone back out to the faith groups and we're asking them again, um, now that many of them have space available because they can't uh, program that space due to social distancing. We're asking them again if they might consider providing any of their spaces that are, um, would be suitable for um, sheltering those of our community who remain unsheltered. So we hope to have um, that information to BC Housing by this week. Um, I see Jason. Uh, just obviously if, if we can get space that's great but island crisis care through our working group that's been together for the last few weeks i think we've communicated several times out there that they're struggling with um, the space at samaritan house already mm -hmm. uh, it's just not uh, adaptable to the social distancing and they've put their hand up within the community as being the lead for if we can open another location they would shift their staff and their services, uh, obviously, and the people that are there to a new location and take the lead on operating that. Um, so that's, that's been something that's been shared through the coalition and shared out uh, for a while. Thank you, Jason. That's something that BC Housing is aware of, and uh, there's another shelter provider who's also offered their services. Uh, at the same time, I think we want to acknowledge the closure of St. Peter's was scheduled. They weren't able to continue. Um, Heidi can speak more to that, but one of their challenges was staffing. And SIA, the Society for um, Equity and Inclusion, one of the things they said is while we couldn't continue operating that shelter, they were providing their staff to make sure Samaritan Health and others could keep going. So it's really encouraging to see, Jason, that collaboration and support um, across the agencies to try and keep the existing shelters going with experienced staff. Um, but it does speak to that real need of experienced staff to support shelter operations. So um, so that's where we're at with the faith groups. Um, Heidi has some. OK, Heidi. Come on, Aaron. Go ahead, Heidi. I, I just wanted to provide another update because um, very, very aware that um, the community is very focused on opening other shelter sites and in order to support nonprofits in staffing up and potentially hiring new staffing complements, what we've been able to arrange with um, the ministry is to fast track or prioritize criminal record checks for our, our homelessness serving providers. So I just wanted to put that out to community that it, if that's a benefit, please let me know. And what we'll do is communicate that request to the ministry and they can prioritize the criminal record check. That's an essential piece of, of the staffing um, steps that needs to be undertaken when, when any of us are dealing with vulnerable individuals. Thanks, Heidi. That's great. And uh, the other thing that I'd add in is other agencies like ours, uh, we've already initiated conversations with our union representatives and all the rest about that if we do have some staff to be able to fill holes and that we'd be able to lend staff to that um, type of response. Uh, there's many of us that have already started that. 
kind of discussion so that we can pool together people that we already maybe have um, in these scenarios. Uh, John and Parmenter, I'll, I'll uh, uh, also uh, throw that we've, we've done a similar uh, in our shop as well uh, with our staff. We're uh, ready to be deployed in other ways as needed. Aaron, I think you had a question, did you? It's been answered, thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I got a question here just for Heidi. Uh, with respect to these fast track criminal record checks, um, this is first news I've heard to me. So that'd be something that basically I'm the only one that can do that. So uh, if you maybe want to talk to me offline about that, that's uh, first I've heard of it. Absolutely. I, I understand it was through um, the Ministry of the Public Affairs and Solicitor General that came through our head office the opportunity for that. We're happy to connect with you, Cameron. Okay, copy, thanks. Okay, and then I think to wrap up, and this will link to the presentation coming at the end, is that we continue as staff, as you're aware from the Health and Housing Task Force, um, you directed us to undertake the systems mapping project through Alina Turner. That work still continues with adaptations. Um, we canceled, we did around 11 design labs uh, before canceling the second round the week of March 23rd. So we think we canceled around 11. And some of those topics were food security, working with the faith group, working with our peers was in the planning works. So we're trying to find alternate ways of doing that engagement and moving that forward. And then we're also working with um, the systems planning uh, team, Turner Strategies, to look at how we can adapt the work we're doing and accelerate it in light of the COVID response. And so, um, Jason, some of the work that you've helped us spearhead with HealthSeeker, looking at engaging that platform to ensure that um, we're getting accelerated use out of it and different organizations can update their status on what services they're able to provide in in a more timely fashion. Um, the coalition's done an excellent job of helping us with that. And so that work continues and we'll be hearing at the end of this meeting from Dr. Turner some ways that, that they can adapt our work with them to help respond to this crisis. So I think with that, I will close. I'll also say that we have other things that staff are working on and continue. So for example, pursuing work on the rent bank and other things that are part of that resiliency and looking at the um, long-term economic impacts that we know this crisis is having immediately and in the long term. So some of that affordable housing and other pieces does continue in the background while um, we respond to the immediate crisis. So. With that, I will stop and maybe we can go to the next. Agenda. Sure. Um, so that brings us up to item D, which I think we were sort of half talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Do we want to continue on with that? Well, I, I wanted to maybe give some time and space to the document, Jason, that was circulated and whether um, you'd like to speak to some of those pieces that were proposed and then to give others the chance to um, chime in, I guess. Yeah. So we're just going to pull it up? Yes. This one? Yes. yes, that's right. I mean, uh, ultimately, if there is clarity through uh, emergency management and that Island Health and BC uh, Housing are leading this, what I would be saying, I mean, obviously, if somebody wants to speak to me, to speak to it, we can. But I would say that if there is community planning that will be going on, that this, this information be refer to them for free, further discussion. Uh, if people do have questions about it, great, but it's, it's the stuff that we've already been talking about. I think what we're trying to just say is there's urgency in it and that we've already talked to agencies that could take leads in different areas. Um, and this was just around suggestions because we didn't really know what was being planned elsewhere. So anything that's on here can also be morphed. Um, and adjusted and changed to to fit the community plan. But I think what we knew uh, in the the agency realm was we were going to be asked to do something within this um, at some point in time, and we just wanted to be prepared for that. Okay. 
Okay, and I just want to thank you for actually putting a draft that is uh, something that people can start working with um, and framing that up, Jason. Um, Heidi, I don't know, think, is Heidi still on the call? Yeah. Yeah. Just hit her. Okay. So, some of those. I'll, I'll, the, the document has been shared around. I would encourage people to look at it. There's a little bit more detail on successive layers that are there. Um, and some of it was through conversations where people had made commitments of what they could do as either either a lead agency or a secondary. Um, and then the other part of it was uh, based on what we're seeing happen in other communities. Um, so it, it, it was us just pulling together what we knew in our community mm -hmm. and what we heard about happening in other others around the province, uh, knowing that I think it was announced today that there's 900 beds through BC Housing have been allocated in communities around the province mm -hmm. and we were wondering and hoping if we're going to get some of those opportunities and Heidi's already spoken to those so I know we will continue those conversations. We just wanted to let people know that considerable thought had been gone into had gone into different parts of this and wherever they fit within the larger plan then then great let people okay. Heidi you had something you'd like to add? Now, I just want to emphasize how I think the overall plan um, that BC Housing and Island Health come, comes forward with, the plan at community is brought forward supplements that you've identified opportunities. So in this, you know, essentially you're making a lot of our work a lot easier. We just, we need to identify the priority populations and what the focus is for the plan and utilizing the resources that have been brought forward through this plan. Okay, thank you. Lisa? And given that I realize this is being live streamed, um, one of the things that we've clarified with BC Housing, and this is more around options, is that the preference is to have people housed within four walls. Um, and steer away from encampments given the challenges and the safety issues we know we've had in the past with that. And so I realized that that was put on there because other communities had maybe started on that path and Heidi has shared with us some lessons learned. Um, sorry, I'll stop there. Okay, I have uh, Jason and then uh, Superintendent Miller. Uh, just, I think the thing that, uh, that I have to make clear there, I'm not suggesting in this one that we're creating encampments. What I'm suggesting is that there are already, that we've mapped upwards of 80 different encampments and encampments that are still being broken up and moved around the community. We still have to support those individuals. Uh, I agree with the four wall solution. Uh, I guess what I'm also trying to put forward is that we have to set aside the politics of what of what people think about homelessness and the, what, the, what the individuals there deserve or not, because even on our side, the reality is, is that there's hundreds of people out there and we know whatever beds we're gonna create uh, are only gonna be for a small portion of them. And that's where we have to be smart. Uh, one of the earlier documents we put in reference to risk, risk stratification, which means saying, say we have 500 to 800 homeless in our community right now and we only get 50 beds well we need to allocate those beds to people that have um, respiratory issues had recent hospital stays for the, the people that will experience complications that if we can support them to get off the street before they fall ill uh, that might help them from falling into the broader um, health system and taking up the limited ICU beds and things you have um, so with whatever we're suggesting when I say encampment support that means the work that we do currently every day uh, we could be smarter about how we support the people that are out there it's not necessarily about creating an encampment um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Superintendent? Thanks very much and thanks for that clarification Jason because there's there's um, there's no way I can support an encampment based on what we happened last time, uh, the victimization, uh, the criminal activity that went on both outside of the camp, within the people within the camp, who amongst themselves, youth being victimized, multiple sexual assaults and everything. Uh, I totally agree with you, uh, setting aside the politics of homelessness. Uh, it's an issue we do have to deal with. 
Um, you know, with respect to 80 plus encampments, I'm not sure if that ac number is accurate. I don't believe it's that high in our community. It's not what I'm being briefed on by my team. Uh, I stand to be corrected on that though. But, you know, with respect to the encampment work you do on a day by day basis, great. But we're still bound by uh, legislative and uh, court decisions, especially this BC Supreme Court uh, ruling on um, camps within parks and whatnot. So that's just kind of my position on that. But glad to, to see that you are not supporting the creation of a, uh, a new encampment or a tent city type area. Do we have anyone else that wants to, um, like, are we done with organizational roles now? Uh, Heidi, I wonder if I might just add that I, I know that the model of Victoria was being reviewed, but there will be an announcement in the next 24 hours that may have still, may have happened already, that Royal Athletic Park is an option in the city of Victoria isn't proceeding that based on um, Island Health and their feedback on preferred model that the outside option isn't the best option. So we want to be strategic with in inside opportunities. So Victoria, the city of Victoria, Island Health and BC Housing continue to work to find opportunities in that area to bring folks inside for shelter or more permanent housing. Kim, did I see you raise your hand or are you just grabbing a beer? Go ahead. Just two points. Uh, one is that uh, I don't think the business community in Kim is going to be on that power working group. And I think for the record, we need to uh, include some consultations as we go along. I raised my hand during that uh, discussion about the subgroup, and it was the reason I couldn't didn't I couldn't raise my hand and hit my unmute switch at the same time. So uh, I, I lost on the mute thing. I was actually suggesting that I not be part of that smaller group. I'm already on the uh, homeless coalition, but I did want to address the the subgroup. Uh, I didn't get want to get in the way of the service delivery, but I did want to make sure that I put forth some cautions about how we exercise and implement and how this impacts the business community, how it impacts the uh, closed, shuttered business community downtown. I have some real valid concerns about that. Uh, also, uh, some member business have uh, raised concerns with me about um, particular uh, uh, food uh, delivery program going on that Wisteria is conducting with no attempts at uh, distancing no permits, um, not not uh, uh, coming close to abiding by VHA guidelines around food storage, food service, that sort of thing. So, really, don't want to see those those kinds of issues get out of control. Um, so that's why I would like to address the group, but not be a part of the group because I don't I don't have a lot um, to do with with delivery, service delivery, and I don't want to get in the way of service delivery. Just, we need to get to that. We need to deploy that as quickly as possible. Thank you for that. Uh, Sheila? Um, thank you, Chair. And just to your point, Kim, I think that the group would be reporting back to this task force, so you'd be able to have your comment and your, and your say at that time. And um, just, just a reminder, this meeting is open. Yep. 
Okay. Thank you, Sheila. And that's what I had intended to do. But if the group, when they meet, uh, wishes to have a discussion or wishes to involve me in any discussion, I'm wide open. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I think we're going to move on. Uh, I think we have people waiting to come into our meeting now. So um, if nobody has any objections, we'll move on to our presentations. And the first one is the Nanomo's Vulnerable Population Overview and COVID-19 Planning uh, by Dr. Alina Turner, who I think is coming. Sure, and Lisa's going to uh, introduce it. Okay, so first of all, I think, have they been admitted into the meeting? Okay, so what, one of the things that we feel is really important is some of the work the systems planning has been doing is looking at what, who is vulnerable in our community in a very broad level. So going beyond those who are the most vulnerable and unhoused, but those who are on the margins due to a range of poverty and other factors. And so the presentation that you're going to see before you is some of the works. Oh, uh, there was a chat. I think they're asking to be admitted, sorry. So we're just, we're trying, trying to get Alina and Dina online here and so I'm online oh you're online wonderful and okay and we need Dina no we've got Dina so we just need Alina Alina are you online there was a chat note from her at 429 saying she had to step away for five minutes okay so Dina are you able to start with the PowerPoint that it is on there. Um, she will have to share the screen again. That's the um, okay. Unfortunately, Alina has the, the PowerPoint. Um, so, I, yeah, I was just going to, to provide contribution to it. Okay, um, so she said she stepped away for a few I seconds. So I mean, I, I can email it if that works. We, we do actually have it. Okay. Um, and the one thing I guess I'll start off by saying is that for those of you who so aren't aware, um, on March 12th, there was a point in time count done uh, with the support coordinated by the John Howard Society and funded through the United Way reaching home dollars. And the outcome of that, the initial results, showed 425 individuals. Uh, and Sydney can speak a little bit more to that while we're waiting for uh, our presenter. Um, and one of the key findings from those initial reports of 425, which is a big jump from the 335 two years ago, um, and we know that 425 is still an undercount. Um, you'll hear Jason and others give much higher estimates. Um, but what was striking for me was that 80% of those individuals who were recorded, there was uh, a mental health challenge and that, that was um, very striking. So there will be more details and reports coming out but um, just wanted for those listening on live stream and those on the task force. Um, to, to be aware of that. And John John McCormick, I'm wondering if you've got anything to add around the point in time count results. Yeah, we, we also believe that it was uh, it was quite a bit less than, than uh, we think we know uh, exists in the street. Uh, we think at least 150 less than we know of, specifically. And uh, uh, we're not sure if some, if some aspect of it was affected by the, uh, by the current COVID-19. Concerns and fears. Um, so we don't know exactly why things turned out the way they did. There's, we also are aware that there's the uh, the homeless population has spread much more widely across the the uh, geographic space than uh, in the past. So um, I think those two things might have contributed as well. So some of this. I think we have a Dr. Turner online now. Don, it's, it's, I, mean, I, I want to comment that um, I believe the last community to do a point time count uh, in the, across the country count, and ours was uh, in the midst of the COVID, the changes around COVID-19, and I, I heard specifically from those who uh, were part of the uh, Magnet event and some of the other uh, Count activities that they got feedback 
that people didn't want to come out to an Ironman event uh, because of fears. Uh, and so, so I, I think it's an undercount because we were the last count uh, in the midst of COVID case. And I just want to put on the record how, uh, how thanks to the RCP, thanks to John Howard, thanks to all of the service providers who participated in and ran the counts this year. It's a lot of work and I really appreciate the limited uh, other service and fulfillment in terms of the uh, coordination on the and you know, where all the locations are, such as Chase and Team and Thanks to the City too. Thank you for that. Doctor, are you ready to go? I don't think she's ready. Yes. Okay, so apologies that uh, Alina will be with us as soon as she can. Uh, yeah. she's, I just uh, told her to try to dial back in. Okay, thanks, Dina. Do you want uh, me to fill time and make another comment? Please do. Uh, just that uh, it's on the head count. It's, it's what I'm hearing from the agency we fund and my wife fund and uh, talking to other funders is the concern about uh, folks who are perhaps not going to be able to afford their apartment. because of the obvious situation. I, I do have it here and ready. Um, don't mind if she wants to see next. If it's easier, uh, Sheila's offering to pull it up and you can just say next slide. Um, just if if your know. bandwidth is yes. a little bit slow. Um, actually, yeah, okay, yeah, it's a little bit slow. Sure, let's pull it up on yours and then I'll just tell you next. Okay. All right, so we'll go next. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the one with the two arrows to the. All right, all there. Okay, um, excellent. 
So we had a working group session to uh, consider the implications of the COVID situation on this project. And you'll recall that these were our um, timelines prior to um, this situation. And where we are is exactly where the arrow points. It's, we were in the middle of the community information and engagement session. So we had done the first round of design labs. We were getting ready to go out to do the second set of design labs. So we were just literally in the middle of it. And we uh, were also in the process of planning our lived experience sessions and our Indigenous engagement um, on and off reserve. So essentially smack in the middle of the process. In considering this, what the um, working group and, and our recommendation was is you know, there's, there's certainly an opportunity to, um, to continue in some fashion, but given how much is, is happening right now and the attention needing to go towards uh, the response in particular, it doesn't make sense to put our energy in, in this, especially because we're in the middle of consultations which were in person. So our recommendation is to press pause essentially on the process and and try to pick things back up once we know uh, where everything shakes out. And that's significant because um, if you go to the next slide, um, we know that our, some of our key deliverables were around the strategic engagement, the funding strategy, coordinated access and, and, um, and systems mapping. And a lot of these pieces um, obviously, with the new funding uh, changes coming in, it makes some of our, the work that we were um, doing a little bit irrelevant slash out of date already. So we um, we did complete the initial needs assessment um, with you know pre COVID, and now I was just taking a look at it earlier today. Um, you know, certainly those those issues will continue to be there and continue to be a priority. However, they are exacerbated shifted because of um, the COVID situation. So it doesn't make sense to go forward blindly, um, but and it also doesn't really make, make sense to um, pretend it's not happening. So hence the focus being on, on this pause, the strategic pause, so that we can focus our attention on the immediate pressure point. Um, so what we then did, and I know we only have 20 minutes to talk to you, but um, next slide, please. What we thought might be a good use of the time today is to say you know, we did have um, the opportunity to mine the data in terms of the pre-COVID world. So um, what was um, significant then and will continue to impact the COVID response are, are the, these particular pressure points. The housing and homelessness, we were able to dig into this and get some, some of the numbers coming out of Nanaimo. Um, we have some sense now of the scope of, of the challenge and, and what that looked like pre-COVID. Um, we were planning to do some financial modeling and impact modeling and scenarios based on um, what was coming in through the consultation process to say, well, here's how much stock you need, here's how many services you need, etc. cetera. Um, with the COVID piece, we don't fully understand what the are going to be on housing and homelessness other than that there there are implications already so um, we can use this information to, um, to kind of put it in your guys minds and as you plan your social response to the pandemic and say that you know, there's different strategies that housing and homelessness sectors across the country are responding to the issues through this strategic lens and we can touch on those if we have a, a chance to today but just to um, emphasize that these issues will continue to be there in the community. Um, they were there pre-COVID, they're gonna to continue to be, be there post-COVID. We just don't fully understand how much worse, essentially, they're, they're going to, to get as a result of the economic impact. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, the mental health and addictions and health challenges, obviously, the. Um, there's different changes that are already emerging on the street when drug supply has been has shifted and the dynamics on, on the street have shifted. So I'm sure you, you guys are familiar with some of these. Um, depending on on uh, the community, we hear more um, more shifts back to alcohol in some contexts because the opiate and, and um, meth is, is not as readily available. But then we also hear uh, in other cases about 
a supply coming from different countries now and, and sometimes being cheaper of, of methamphetamines as well. So um, again, it's, it's, it's shifted the, the flow of goods um, expectedly. So that's gonna be, have an impact on the street as well. Um, mental health and, and just a general anxiety. You can probably um, hear from my kid in the background that we're all experiencing additional stresses and this is gonna be um, additionally emphasized in, in vulnerable populations. And the way that uh, it's, you know, you gotta take into consideration your food security, your some of your mental health and addiction stats were already um, higher or we're doing not, not as well, if you will, compared to the provincial average even before the, the pandemic. So this is gonna continue to, to be a pressure point um, through this uh, period and into recovery. Uh, next one, please. Okay, and obviously I think we've talked about this quite a bit that you have a low-income population that is, is now going to be joined by an, a whole swath of new folks that have potentially never experienced vulnerability the way that they are today. So that the, you know, that being the first time in to the system or experiencing a system that we know is quite fragmented, it's gonna add to the frustration and um, they're, they're not necessarily used to navigating the system, if you will, because they haven't potentially never experienced it before. So uh, next one, please. Sorry, and I'm having to rush through it just because I know I only have 20 minutes and I want to get to some of the ideas in terms of what you, what communities are doing um, in terms of solutions as well. So well-being and safety, um, again, hearing from other countries and other jurisdictions that family violence and domestic violence pressures have we also hear about vulnerable communities where people start to kind of, um, band together to share, to get off the street, etc. Or encampments increasing in other contexts because people are wanting to self-isolate in different ways. But those again present different stresses as people are overcrowded and, and living in tense situations as well. Next one. I think you guys have seen these before. Chantal's gonna get mad that I'm not going through it, <laughs> but I know we're we're running out of time. Right, uh, I can explain. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Next one. Uh, okay. Just a, again, a Chantal's point that you have a a seniors population with health conditions that are making them more susceptible. And I'm sure you can relate to, to the news on, on this item. So we, our, the vulnerable population is not just the homeless population and health and housing is not just about that particular subgroup. It's the, the vulnerability has um, is expanded, has potentially always been expanded, but it's, it's certainly expanded right now to other groups as well. Uh, next one. So what are we seeing across the country? And you can see there that what you're experiencing is, is uh, what we're hearing from, and we're in touch with about 100 communities across the country. So these are, this is what uh, they're, everyone is facing. So in some ways you're, you're not alone. And this is what communities are responding to in, in some really creative ways. So next one, please. Okay. Where communities are, and again, we're making all this up as we go along, right? So I don't want to pretend like we have all the solutions at all, but in communities where there seems to be um, active mobilization, there is a coordination infrastructure in place around the COVID social response in particular. So yes, you're going to have the medical response. Yes, you've got to keep the lights on and, and all that kind of immediate and emergency piece, but there's usually a social complement to that effort. And that obviously takes coordination infrastructure. So there's a lead uh, person or persons or group that's taking the charge on getting everything together and, and mobilized. The needs assessment, you just had a needs assessment in two seconds. Needs assessments need to happen in an agile manner and you need to be responsive all the time. The systems mapping, so understanding what's still standing in your community because lots of the um, social safety net has shifted how it's doing its work. And there's because there's so many SMEs or small, medium-sized shops that are impacted by people getting sick, etc. The service has, could be there one day and disappear the next. So it, it's 
quite essential in your emergency response that you know exactly what's still operating in the social safety net so that you know when you're sending people the numbers uh, still working the shop still offering service i say shop but it's it's usually voluntary organizations or charities that are primarily doing this which makes them quite critical partners but the other point here is around civil society mobilization and we talked a lot about how to engage civil society in this effort and not to rely solely on government and and charitable sector because there was they're going to get tapped out if they're not tapped out already so if there's an opportunity to um, get voluntary based mobilized to support the effort this is the time and again we have some great examples from across the country of where this has occurred and Tina if we have time we'll share what Abbotsford is doing in a BC context the tech stack so we obviously we're all going virtual we're uh, we're having to mobilize in, in very different ways and leveraging technology is just essential and just, um, knowing exactly how your community and what solutions you're doing if you're going to be using as a community is going to be key because the last thing you want to deal with is um, incompatible technologies public engagement and pr public relations work especially around systems mapping and what's available and you know we are obviously have worked with you guys to help seeker to make sure that you're uh, your system is up to date and, and we know what's available. But what we don't know right now is what's COVID available in the social safety net right now. And for instance, in, um, in Alberta, there's 500 new programs of social supports, mental health, home delivery uh, services that for seniors, social isolation, wellness checks, all of these different new programs that have popped up in the last two weeks. And there's about 500 and more coming on every day. So um, if there's a way that you can do a call to action on, depending on your needs, and needs are pretty consistent. Food security has been the number one COVID-related need that we've seen across the country. So food security. The second one has been housing and homelessness-related supports. Um, and then the third one has been mental health and um, abuse addictions, domestic violence, so that whole agglomeration of mental health and addictions challenges um, that that's around vulnerable populations so this is a, it has to be a community response and it, it's going to take that coordination to to make it happen amongst these different groups and adjusting in real time because we don't know what's around the corner um i think i'm just i'll maybe you can flip through just so people see what else is there this i was going to show you how lethbridge has mobilized these are their pods that are made up of different businesses, nonprofits, charities, government, and they mobilize around the issues. These pods enacted um, 300 different new programs and services. The point there is, is coordination um, and that it takes the whole community. Next slide. That's how we leverage Help Seeker to support them so that there's a real time digital um, access to services as well, especially because Again, we don't know from day to day what's still available, so making that as real time as possible. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then coordinated access during COVID, so that this is not the time to give up on all the work that you're doing. This is the time to accelerate it and, and get it going really quickly. So all of the stuff that I presented to you, uh, Lethbridge did in 48 hours. So it's it's absolutely essential that uh, that you move quickly with the best information that you have and you're okay to, to fall on your face sometimes and just pick up and, and try something else. So uh, next one, um, data, it's okay, you can just keep going. <laughs> this point, point here is that you need data to make decisions so that you know what's happening. You can, yeah, and then um, Dina, I think we have like two to five minutes for you. <laughs> sure. So uh, with respect to the Abbotsford efforts in a British Columbia context, we do recognize that the province has been mandated to exercise their responsibilities, um, both for housing, Fraser Health, the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction are the three main statutory agencies that are exercising their mandate with COVID response in Abbotsford. Um, but in conjunction with that, uh, we mobilized all of our community resources to prepare uh, the community infrastructure to support their efforts. So we've broken that down into three tiers. So tier one is really taking a look at a shelter for vulnerable individuals. 
who are asymptomatic to build immunity or reduce risk of contracting or transmitting COVID. Um, that has been secured in a local church. Uh, so through the Abbotsford Homelessness Prevention Response System efforts, we created a community response team that included our provincial partners on it. Uh, so now BC Housing is taking the lead to activate that shelter. Fraser Health is now stepping up to take a look at how health services are going to be linked in. Uh, Ministry of Social Development is offering an integration worker on site and then our uh, prevention and response system will link it to our food systems, a uh, shower initiative, a uh, transportation initiative um, that has been activated and then also we're mobilizing our local volunteers through the schools who where their students are at home, um, also uh, university students and some of the nonprofits who are willing to step up. So for example, creating hygiene caps. So for people who are either staying in the shelter or maybe staying in the tier three hotel accommodation, they'll receive hygiene caps and then also mobilizing our peers. Uh, we have quite active kind of peer led um, initiatives through the drug war survivors and other groups. So they can help with the overdose prevention um, services as well. The isolation site is on hold because this is a very health intensive um, process so we're not quite there yet with respect to Fraser Health identifying how they can support that. However, a, a different local church has stepped up to offer their site uh, for that and we're working closely with Division of Family Practice and our community partners if that has to be activated. Uh, but with respect to Tier 2, this is actually, we, uh, as of March 30th, activated mobile assessment and testing. So through Division of Family Practice, they're going to all of our shelters and supported housing to provide testing for individuals who are symptomatic. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I think I went over this already kind of in my caption on slide one, but it truly is a community effort, even though, I, so we're, we're recognizing as a community how we can work up to the provincial mandate uh, because we understand kind of at a broader systems level, for example, the food uh, system access that Alina pointed to, that was key for us as well. So our food bank is the cornerstone agency, um, Salvation Army and Union Gospel Mission are mobilizing uh, their mobile food service outreach to um, various areas of the city. And then unused food that is coming from restaurants that are no longer in operation or Salvation Army's reduced level of service are going to the food bank. And so those can be dispersed throughout the fam to the families through the school district that have often depended on hamper programs to our um, supported housing, scattered site supporting housing site, and uh, then we'll also help to support the shelter system as well. So um, we've all kind of taken the parts where we can, um, and then also refresh shower initiative um, through the Baker v. Mennonite Church will mobilize at the community of care shelter to provide the shower provision where, because Baker v. Church lacks showers. Um, next slide. So with that, um, these are kind of our key areas um, of support. So as Alina pointed out, the coordination activity is still happening out of our unit, the housing premises unit. Now we are also the hub of the Fraser Valley Community Entity for Service Canada Fund. Uh, so we were, were supporting um, the overall response planning through a community COVID-19 community response team. And we're now also looking at transition from corrections into communities. So we have all of our corrections partners and police department at the table working through that with our health partners as well. Um, the community van initiative is pretty phenomenal. We have our Indo-Canadian Business Association, um, MSA Ford, and two other non local nonprofits, Archway and Cyrus Center, who have offered to provide vans and drivers to ensure we get our folks to the shelter sites or to hospital or to health appointments. Communication access, we're working quite closely with Help Seeker. 
So we've um, updated all of our services with the COVID information, and we're also rolling out the community voicemail program in the next two weeks for individuals who, who don't have an access to a telephone or Wi-Fi, so they can receive um, messages. Um, they can we can blast public notifications and then provide information on how they can connect to Help Seeker and the various supports in our community. Um, and then I spoke to the food systems and the care pack. Also, um, we work closely with our early years leadership table. This kind of feeds into Signe's point about looking at the next tier of vulnerability in your community, because we're starting to better understand what that looks like for our families um, and children. Um, also, with respect to first responders who may need childcare uh, during these times, we're able to link that through our child uh, care resource and referral who sit at part of that table. So we're just continuous flow of information to all of our various pods, as uh, Alina had mentioned, Lethbridge has. Um, because we're entering into a tri for type relationship with Luminative Housing, who is the provincial indigenous uh, community entity, we've been able to mobilize and, and leverage support already for both our on and off reserve indigenous communities. Um, and I think that's in the nutshell. As Alina said, we're just leaning in and we started small, um, but already activation is happening on the ground. Um, not soon enough, uh, because as you, as local community, we recognize that we're much more nimble than sometimes the province can be with their mandates and their responsibility um, overall in the entire province. But what we can do is make sure our community infrastructure is ready to go and to activate as the province works through their components of um, their activities on the ground. And next. It's done. Oh, I think that's your last slide, Dina. Yep. All right. Yeah. Wow, that was remarkable. Very nice. <laughs> See, I, I'm sure you guys always say we're long-winded, and bam, we weren't this time. <laughs> Who has time nowadays? <laughs> yeah. Is there any questions of the doctor or, or Dina? We're not I guess I'd like to make a comment and thank you both for being open and adaptive and, and all the suggestions that have come through. Um, you, Dina, and also Chantel. So that's been very helpful to have been going through the process. At first we were disappointed it was disruptive, but at least being grateful that we've started it and can leverage this work. So I think I'd just like to um, say thank you. Yes, uh, Kim? There, I'm unmuted now. Uh, is this slide deck available for us now? Is that something that we can uh, distribute? Oh, yes. 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 Oh, yes. Yes, it can, it'll be put on the city's website along with the minutes under committees and meetings. So, Kim, we'll make sure that we send a link to that when it's available. A bit easier than sending you a large file, perhaps. Thank you. If you if you want it sooner, we can email it to you. I think it's about three megs, right? Um, usually, supplemental items oh, Kim, are put on the website tomorrow, so it'll be on our website tomorrow, and this video will be on our website tomorrow, and the live stream um, is still happening and did work today. So. Thank you very much. I'd like to look at it uh, from the, from the perspective of the business community a little bit closer, of course. Mm -hmm. okay. The other question, uh, not question, but suggestion is if there's folks that are looking to mobilize around vulnerable seniors or vulnerable families and are wanting to um, activate volunteers, et cetera, there's a webinar that's gonna happen this Thursday on how um, different communities are, are doing that as well. So there's lots of um, sharing of what's working and what our learnings are as we go. So we're happy to keep um, sending that along to you guys. The business community has been hugely supportive of, of has really stepped up in this work. Civil society includes everyone. So we've, we've seen some really cool ideas coming out of um, the business sector right now. So, so props to you ahead of time, because I'm sure your, your, your wheels are spinning right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Okay, with that said, I think we're almost at the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, a special thanks to go out to all of our first responders out there and for the people who are working on the streets. Uh, uh, my hat's off to you and all the staff here and the work that you're doing. My highlight today was this meeting. My second highlight was uh, working on my chicken coop. So many thanks to you folks for all the work that you're doing, uh, keeping the rest of us safe. So thanks for that. Uh, with that said, um, I don't think we have any other business. Um, is there anything else you'd um, like to add? Thank you, Chair. Just a next meeting date. So um, would two weeks from this date work or possibly the Wednesday, two weeks um, from tomorrow? for the next Health and Housing Task Force. Or we could we could send out an email with some potential options, but is two weeks the time frame we were looking at, correct? I, I think so. So we'll, we'll send out an email with some potential options for our next meeting and, and those going forward. And uh, special, uh, you know, uh, hopefully that we get our the food uh, subcommittee uh, meeting well and, and success in there as well. Lisa, did you have anything to add? We'll send out an invite uh, tomorrow for that food security group and get that moving pretty fast here. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, um, then I think we're looking for an adjournment. Two people put up your hand, please. You're moved by Kim, seconded by Lisa. All in favor? Thank you. Have a great night and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Okay, do I have to shut off this mic? Let me know when we're yes. live. Yeah, no, we're no longer streaming. No longer streaming? Just a second. Just always forget. Can I? Is this it? I think it's. Actually, I get calls to my chicken. I don't have a permit for my chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Is it less than 10 by 10?